Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Business and Policy Dialogue. We are here to discuss a very important topic, which is not only important, but also contextual. Uh, we have two experts with us today to discuss a roadmap to create a future-ready human capital. A vibrant human capital is critical to make a mark in the global knowledge economy, and India's demographic dividend will only be a boon when its human capital is in sync with the latest technological transformations and disruptions. In this regard, the role of higher education and skill development institutions and must be structured in such a way that the students and the young workforce are prepared for the current and future needs of the global labor market. Uh, we have with us this afternoon, Sri Naveen Mittal, IAS, Commissioner for Collegiate and Technical Education Government of Telangana. And in conversation with him is Professor Chandrasekhar Shripada, Professor uh, of Organizational Behavior and Executive Director of the Human Capital and Leadership Initiative at the Indian School of Business. Uh, Shri Mittal is an officer of the Indian Administrative Service, born on the Telangana Kader, and is a uh, member of the 1996 batch of the IAS. Uh, and in his current role as Commissioner for Collegiate and Technical Education, he's led several initiatives, especially during the pandemic, also notably increasing the enrollment in higher education institutions in the state of Telangana. He'll be with, today sharing his insights on this topic. So, Professor Chandra Shripada heads the Human Capital and Leadership Initiative at ISB and comes with a very strong background in the industry and is what, what is a person who very aptly fits the description of a academic, a practitioner and an academic. We have uh, the, the rules of the uh, dialogue, the sort of the framework is fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, Professor Chandra Shripada will introduce and set the context, invite Mr. Mittal to say, uh, share his thoughts, engage in a conversation with each other, and then we will open up questions. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience towards the end. So those of you in the audience with questions uh, either now or during the dialogue, please post them on the Q&A window of the Zoom uh, you know, platform, and we'll take it uh, as the time arises. With those words of introduction, I again welcome all of you uh, for joining us this afternoon. And over to you, uh, Professor Chandra at the ISD studios. Thank you. Thank you, Guru. <clears throat> Navinji, welcome. And I've been looking forward to this chat with you um, as I teach, read, and research on the subject of human capital uh, in India as well as uh, other parts of the world. Uh, we have been observing uh, uh, sometimes a disappointing gap between what we visualize, idealize, and theorize and what happens on the ground. And among the various stakeholders who can perhaps fill the gap are people like you who are at uh, the right helm of affairs, you know, in bringing policy to practice and grounding uh, programs that will really raise the human capital for the future. Uh, uh, we, we, we don't have to run again, once again, no, I'm, our audience knows, everyone knows that uh, human capital is distinctly the competitive advantage of nations. And in India, if there was a capital in the world for human capital, it will be India. Because it, we just are not in numbers, but in skills and in our readiness to be global with a unique access to English as well as other languages. We seem to be at the front runner of the, of the human capital race, if you like. So if we can just hone our human capital for the future, we probably will be the, the nation of uh, that leads the world in some sense, which has been the aspiration. And, but that's a journey which has to be marked by what civil servants like you do with states and states infrastructure and uh, it, its uh, curriculum and the, the, the education system in gearing up it for the future. So uh, mine is partly uh, this dialogue that I was looking forward to uh, is partly uh, an inquiry. It's about knowing what you're doing. It's also partly to be an education. I want to learn as to where is the next agenda? Well, how can we all contribute? And thirdly, it is information to the audience to bring them up to speed about how we are thinking about human capital and how can you as community and responsible citizens, they can even contribute to it. So I think it, though the, we don't physically engage with the audience here, I would guess they are our partners here. Yes. And together, we, I mean, I would love to have a dialogue where I uh, kind of engage with you in exploring what is happening 
what more can happen and what can we do about it. So to start with, as the commissioner and the chief of the collegiate and technical education, <clears throat> in the time you have had, what have you been driving? What are the key programs? Where are you taking the collegiate education? From where to where? If you can give us an overview and an outline of that, then we can talk right. about it. Uh, thank you, Chandraji. Uh, I must say that it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here with you talking about the, the future-ready uh, uh, workforce, uh, which our country desperately needs, I would say, to really reach the uh, position which it deserves in the, in the, in the, in the global front. Uh, so I've been in this department for uh, more than three years now. And there have been a bunch of things which we have uh, actually done and uh, are in the process of doing also. So some of them uh, uh, I would uh, kind of give you in a, in a, in a brief nutshell. Uh, one of the things which we have done is uh, uh, focus a lot on uh, especially the government institutions in the state of Telangana. Mm -hmm. So we've got about 131 government colleges. Mm -hmm. And uh, we realized that uh, many of those colleges were having outdated uh, uh, courses and mm -hmm. outdated combinations. Mm -hmm. So we went about kind of uh, looking at completely reorganizing uh, those courses. And we did this process uh, in the academic year of 2018-19. Mm -hmm. We brought in modern combinations, for example, computer science in, uh, as, a, as, as an option in physical sciences, uh, uh, computer applications as, a, as an option for BCom, and uh, even in uh, uh, BA, we, we brought in uh, 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 more modern combinations. And uh, uh, the net result of that is that we saw almost like a 42% a, a growth in our admissions in one single year. We also mm. brought in 42% uh, uh, in one single year. Mm. And we also brought in uh, English medium actually into our colleges because uh, though we would uh, want our students to study in, uh, in, in, in the local language or mother tongue, but the social aspirations are very different. I mean, the parents as well as the students, they want to uh, study in uh, a language which helps them into uh, integrate into the, the market yeah. economy yeah. much more. And uh, we carried on this process so much so that uh, this year uh, we have got a cumulative increase of about 61% over the corresponding figures. And uh, this trend is uh, going on. Uh, the second thing which we did is uh, we brought in a lot of flexibility in our uh, combination. You know, NEP talks about mm. uh, flexibility in, uh, in, 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 in courses and curriculum. And we actually did that in the academic year 2019-20 for our government colleges. In the sense that we, we came out of the rigid uh, combinations which were had earlier there. For example, there were fixed combinations like math, physics, chemistry, or um, history, economics, and political science. And we, we brought in something called a bucket system. That there are four buckets to choose from. And within the bucket, you can choose any course. Mm. Uh, you can choose three out of the four buckets. Mm. And that was highly successful. Mm. In the sense that I can give you an example of a college here, a uh, government degree college, Begumpet wherein we had only about 11 fixed combinations. Mm. And once we brought in flexibility, the number of combinations student could choose or, mm. or actually chose went up to 53. Wow. Uh, it's like like five times uh, increase in the number of... Uh, so looking at that... So then, can someone do physics and music? Uh, not music uh, as of now, but yeah. somebody can actually do, uh, let's say, uh, physics, maths and economics. Oh, you can. Okay, that's or, quite a step ahead. Yes, or yeah. maths, economics, and uh, statistics. Mm. Or, well, I mean, you can, yeah, you can, yeah, so, yeah. so the subjects are actually uh, in, in four yeah. buckets. Okay. And uh, uh, we, we took this for a step ahead in the academic year uh, 2021, that is last year, mm. though we were in the pandemic, mm. and we extended it to all the private colleges also. And this has really uh, uh, taken a step ahead of other states in terms of flexibility we provide. Mm -hmm. In fact, we, we actually did this uh, uh, a few months before the NEP actually talked about it. Okay. Uh, so that's the second thing. The third thing uh, I would uh, like to talk about is in the technical education sector, uh, wherein we have brought in, uh, uh, or allowed our uh, engineering colleges to opt for new and emerging technology uh, areas. Mm -hmm. And that has also given very good results. Mm -hmm. For example, there was a net increase of about mm. 17,500 seats only in emerging areas mm. last year. And this has gone up to 24,500 this year, mm. uh, which is AI and ML, data science, cybersecurity, uh, IoT, 
uh, and and robotics and they're all being taught as they're, they're all being they're all they're all they're all uh, full credit for full no they are all actually programs, programs. Uh, so you can actually do a btech in computer science and engineering With ai and ml oh, or or btech mm. in computer science and engineering let's say iot or cyber security or data science mm. uh, and we we saw that uh, uh, almost we have a we have a, a success rate of about 90% in filling up these seats Okay. Uh, last year as well as this year, mm. uh, so that that has that has that is really moving us into the direction of uh, new and emerging technologies. Uh, another important thing which we have done is uh, uh, we've brought in a lot of the employability management and life skills, which were actually not uh, uh, credit uh, courses earlier, which were actually uh, left to the colleges to give us an add-on. For the students to not improve their employability uh, in the in the campus, we brought in some of these courses into the core of the curriculum as credit courses, mm. and this was done in the in the in the in the in the college at education in the year 2019, as well as to great extent even in the engineering education uh, based on the new model curriculum of the AICT, mm. and we feel that uh, this is something which can which 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 really needs to be kind of taken further forward because we've got some very good success in that. The interest which the students are taking now in some of these uh, skills is much, much higher than when they were optional. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, I can also yeah. talk about some of the technology integration which we have done, uh, no, especially in, in the way the teaching, teaching happens, happens uh, mm -hmm. during COVID. I mean, we forced like any other state uh, to actually go online. And uh, that has also helped our faculty to really learn uh, some of these online presentation skills yeah, uh, yeah, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very big way. We all learned, even at ISB. Mm -hmm. I was myself trained for a couple of months, actually, to teach on the new media, the Zoom or Teams or right. all these new ways. Mm -hmm. So, no, this sounds like a very uh, important progress that you have made in a short time. You're saying that you kind of broadened the course offerings, you allowed greater flexibility, and you introduce new age skills based uh, to based to the main tradi traditional engineering curriculum, and all the subjects you mentioned, cybersecurity, IoT, our future looking skills in in which the you know the economy is growing, and you also are looking at life skills, and uh, I want to follow up on that issue. You know the I think um, uh, education for a while has been rather employment focused, and which is right. Uh, but employment itself uh, is now a part of the more extended social skill and not merely the domain mm -hmm. skill. So employers are looking for more holistic individuals who not only know their subject, but also can work with others and be part of teams and innovate. So tell us a little more about what are you doing in getting engineers and other graduates ready with life and employment skills? So, uh, 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 first I will talk about the degree uh, mm. education, mm. wherein a uh, lot more flexibility was available to us to, you know, to, to work on it. Mm. Uh, so, we've actually worked on three areas. Mm. Uh, one was uh, English language as an offering. Mm. So, we had uh, uh, 20 credit courses of English language for every degree program. Mm. And when we really looked into the depth of it, we were finding that we were actually teaching uh, English literature to even science students. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not against English literature per se, but then the question is that whether this will really be... It's a, not the practical English skill. You exactly, know, one, whether it is a life skill, skill yeah, or yeah. a business skill or an employability skill, which the student would actually be used, using it True. to further either his career or his own, uh, I would say, life in, uh, in some way. Mm. Uh, uh, and when we looked at it, we were we were actually able to transform the English language offering into more of a communication offering. Okay. Uh, so uh, these these courses have been transformed into communication, which is which is in fact recognized as one of the key twenty uh, first uh, century uh, skill which is required uh, in terms of both uh, reading, writing, and speaking. And uh, uh, along with this, we also uh, were able to integrate. Uh, some of the uh, uh, other uh, important uh, things which are required. For example, one of one of the three credit courses in English is now human value and eth ethics. Wonderful. So it's not a separate course, but mm. but human value value and ethics is taught as a as a course uh, 
uh, along with English. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, then there's also a course on uh, gender skills, gender sensitization. Uh, uh, there's a there's a course on um, business uh, uh, English. There's a course on uh, communicative English, basic communicative and advanced communicative. So this is one area which was worked upon. The second was uh, integration of computer skills. Okay. So uh, we we had a, a thing called. Uh, skill enhancement courses, which is called SCC, which are these two credit courses uh, which UGC prescribes for degree programs. Mm. Uh, uh, and there are, there, are, there are four such courses which a student has to uh, do, uh, SCC and uh, uh, ability enhancement. Uh, so two of them have now become computer uh, courses, Oriented, that okay. is basic computer skills and advanced computer skills, wherein uh, every student is now made to work on uh, computers because that's a very essential skill. And then there is... Uh, 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 also focus on man, uh, uh, managerial skills, uh, which is which includes time management, uh, human management, uh, team building, uh, uh, those sort of things, and also employability skills, which includes uh, uh, some bit of uh, uh, analytical skills, uh, problem solving, you know, critical thinking, those kind of skills. So, so this we felt is a is a is a well rounded that is offering. Quite a, quite a step ahead. I mean, if I was thinking of how it was during my yeah. time. So you seem to have made a lot of progress. So moving on, the other thing, curiosity I have is, see, our problem seems to be, I'm, I want to know how Telangana state is addressing it, uh, is that there is a huge rural urban divide. Yes. And obviously resources are, because employment is focused here, industrialists are here, the big cities are endowed with greater resources. The colleges look better, teachers stay here, so you attract better teachers. So how are you addressing the quality of education issue in the rural Telangana? So, uh, so uh, one of the ways we do that is uh, to ensure our government institutions are, are well spread. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so both government as well as the private sector is in the market. Mm. Uh, private sector will be where the bulk of the students are. The mm. private sector would not go to the area where getting students is, uh, is difficult. Mm. Uh, so, so one of the prime uh, uh, objectives of uh, government uh, is to ensure uh, equity as well as inclusivity mm. in the sense that the institution should be well spread. Mm. And I can tell you that uh, uh, these 131 government uh, colleges which we have mm. are very well spread across the state. In fact, some mm. of them are in the midst of uh, tribal areas. For example, there is a college which is located in Amrabad. Mm. Which is which is the tiger reserve uh, 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 on way to Shri Salem. Mm. Uh, it's it's in the right in the midst of the of of the forest, mm. uh, and provides access to the students mm. where no other institutions is available. Mm. Mm. Uh, so that is one. That mm. is that is the location of it. Two is uh, uh, I fully agree with you that teachers would not want to go there. Mm. So uh, we also have this problem in the sense, you know, uh, we do have a lot of uh, vacancies of teachers. And most of our regular as well as uh, contractual teachers who are there, they would prefer to be closer to uh, uh, the cities. And uh, uh, we we are in the process of ensuring that we, <coughs> we go in for a round of recruitment. There are some technical issues uh, pertaining to the bifurcation of the state, mm. which have been more or less sorted out. And uh, uh, we, we expect to go in for recruitment uh, very shortly. But till that is done, we have engaged uh, guest lecturers uh, 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 in a big way. And uh, uh, in fact, we have last year and year before last, we have ensured that every single college in the state mm. has every single required faculty. Mm. So I can I can confidently tell you that every single college... That is quite an accomplishment. Every mm. single college in our state has 100% uh, required faculty, both last academic year and year before, and the same we are ensuring this year also. Mm. Um, uh, either as a regular lecturer, Lecture, lecture, uh, lecture, or as a contractual lecturer, or as a, as a guest lecturer. Okay. So you because have where you can't get regularly people yeah. here, at least moving the guest lecturers. And even for engaging guest lecturers, mm. uh, we ensure that we 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 take the qualified ones. Mm. So uh, the first preference goes to a PhD uh, uh, personnel. Yes. Uh, if if you have a PhD available, we take. Mm. If PhD is not available, we go in for net or slet which mm. is the national eligibility test or the state yeah. level eligibility test, right. qualified person. And if that is not available, then only we go for a basic master's. Right. So that ensures at least uh, right. Right. academically they are qualified. 
and we also our uh, our, our methodology of selection is also through a demo lecture mm. so we have a, we have a committee which actually see how the teacher is teaching mm. so if you have let's say two phd uh, persons coming right then right. the person who can teach better is actually selected mm. and this is all kind of i would say decentralized down to the down to the district level mm. how how is the spread of those 100 plus colleges that you talked about you know one of the classic images through which we all grown up is that oh look at uh, lal bahadur shastri he had to cross two rivers to go to a college some all the big people of this country seem to have traveled a lot just to be able to go to a college or a school has that problem been addressed so uh, do so, we are we just spread enough yeah, yeah. so so, so i'll tell you the the benchmark of uh, uh, various levels of institution mm. so a primary school is available in almost i would say every hamlet or habitation of the state mm. uh, in fact the right to education uh, prescribes a minimum of 10 students to you know have a school mm. but i can tell you there are schools uh, in our state which are catering to even lesser than that number of students because there is a primary school in every habitation mm. a high school would probably be uh, a, a group of uh, uh, villages. Uh, villages maybe a large village or a group of smaller villages mm. would have a high school uh, a, a junior college uh, on an average you know there could be kind of a little bit more or less but mm. on an average a junior college is there for every mandal of the state okay and uh, a, a degree college i can tell you on an average is for every assembly constituency of the state this is this is the kind of that's what about 22 50 kilometers of travel max that that would be probably 50 would be would be on the higher side i would yeah. say 22 25 kilometers that's still very manageable yeah. and if public transport is now grown yeah. then obviously that's not as bad as it used to be that right. and right. many of these colleges also have uh, uh, a kind of a facility uh, which is run by our welfare departments that is social welfare or bc welfare or tribal welfare in terms of a hostel mm. so that uh, students who, can the, they can they can those, they can actually they can stay closer the, to who can't travel can come and live closer very true that's great progress so let's move on to another subject which worries us as we think of you know we are thinking of human capital for the future but uh, the people who prepare the human capital for future are the teachers the lecturers the professors their own readiness is a subject of big concern you know because they need to be trained they need to be uh, understanding the new age skills new age pedagogy what for how to teach so what what work is happening in that direction so i think that's a that's a that's a very very important question in fact it, it is it is the question which i thought i will ask you we we'll talk I'll, about I'll, what we think we should yeah, do yeah. but i want so, to know what so, are you doing so so uh, i'll first tell you about what what is the scenario and maybe then uh, uh have your inputs also on no how do we move forward on it mm. so i think pedagogy is a is a very very important uh, uh, uh aspect of education and somehow uh, uh it is it is universally acknowledged no in in uh, by the experts in the sector that the pedagogy in the education sector has not changed uh, uh, i would say in last few hundred years no True. if True. You, if you go to any classroom <clears throat> uh let's say you do a time travel 100 years back or no few years back uh, covid has little bit changed you would not recognize whether you are in in, in 19th century or early yeah. part of uh, 21st century it, it looks very very similar probably there's the 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 color of the board has changed it was it used to be black with a ch- white chalk but it has become and let's green. say a white board or yeah, a green, green board with let's say <laughs> markers yeah, yeah. Uh, or maybe there's an addition of a projector but 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 the fundamental nature of classroom has not undergone a change covid to a great extent has disrupted uh, this much uh, much needed uh, or brought in this much needed change i would say because uh, uh, everybody was saying that no education has to change and then covid brought in this uh, this huge i would say change uh, probably something which would have taken let's say 10 more years has happened in actually a matter of uh, uh, a few months uh, 12 to 15 months it has it has it has happened uh, now this gives us an opportunity to to look at what should be the future of education be mm, mm. and i think uh, the future of education has to be in a, in a, in a way that it focuses on learning because it has it has focused too much on content and knowledge in the past true, true. so it has to change from content and knowledge to more of learning and then uh, skills which are really required uh, to be successful and for that to happen i think uh, uh 
the, the, the nature of the classroom also has to undergo change. I still see, in fact, uh, even during COVID, I, I was looking at it, you know, and then this, this actually is an experience from one of our polytechnic institutions. So I, I actually uh, try to look at what our teachers are doing. And then I found that our teachers are still dictating uh, notes to the students. To remember for the exam. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so what I'm trying to say is that is, that is not taking us anywhere. Yeah, I know. Uh, Let's and, talk about that. I will yeah. share with you my perspective and on that. And this, this probably has to, has to change. True. Uh, in the sense that uh, content is available on the fingertips of the students. Uh, I think what we need to do is probably the work which has to happen is in terms of curating some of the content which they can view at their own time and at their own pace. And the classroom has to change more into this, Discussion. this two-way communication. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is what my feeling is. And oh, I, would yeah, be, yeah. I would be happy to, no, to no, we hear have found, from... We have found a word for it. Yeah, it's yeah. called the flip classroom. Right, right. You know? So there is a nice way of right. saying that. So you're absolutely bang on. That is the matter of great concern. So let me add my little bit to that, you right. know. And I'm sure it will somewhere inform policy and then gradually it will become practice. <clears throat> the first at a very meta, meta level, we need to first recognize what has changed with the advent of um, information um, being more easily available through Googles and Facebooks of the world and social media and the internet is that um, um, the purpose of education is, has to be more about asking questions mm. than about finding answers. Because answers are all available. Whatever answer you want, so the notes that that teacher was dictating, by the way, is available almost for free yeah. on, the, on the internet. So if you just get the right kind of internet access, students need more searching skills than uh, knowing skills, you know. Mm -hmm. So we should, as we, if we believe that change, first we have to understand that change. What is informing the new pedagogy is the first realization that learning is not about information gathering. It's about what to do with the information. It's about converting the information into useful action mm -hmm. that causes some change in the life and society. If that happens, the next big thing that happens in the mindset and the skill set of a teacher is to become more what I call student-centric or learner-centric than teacher-centric. So we, we say that we, we are, for example, at ISB, when I go to a class, I don't see myself as what I call a sage on the stage who's giving a lecture, mm -hmm. uh, but I see myself as a guide on the side, mm -hmm. somebody who's facilitating the learning of an already, you know, ready student who just needs a little bit of facilitation to make the next steps. So the third issue is to move learning, exactly the point you said, learning to, um, learning content to learning to learn. Mm -hmm. Because all learning has an expiry date. Mm -hmm. But learning to learn has no expiry date. That, and it is lifelong learning that, that will continue. And in the ability to create a condition where students will be curious, inquisitive, and have a desire to learn is the job of the new age teacher. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? You do that by blending action into learning. So this whole action learning projects, project-based learning, community action learning, taking students out the, of the classroom and getting them to do things, including in art subjects. Not Sometimes back it was felt that, you know, you can do it only if there is a scientific experiment. You want to introduce a uh, student to uh, understand a tree, you take him to a forest. But if you want to introduce a student to a stock exchange, you can take him to a stock exchange. You want to introduce him to an IoT uh, machine, you can take him to a factory. And if you want him to do something, you want him to understand why vaccination must be given during COVID, make him a volunteer. Even a school student can become a college student, definitely can. So if we can somehow make almost half of learning into action-based projects, which bring students with the reality outside the classroom, with society, with community, with jobs, with factories, and in increase more internship opportunities apprentices, then that much needed collaboration 
of classroom with the real world will happen. Otherwise, we are keeping them in a cocoon, feeding, feeding them with an overload of information, which by the time they come out, they don't know what to do with, because we haven't been teaching them problem solving. So the big changes pedagogy is seeing is making education more immersive, more action-centered, more um, student-centered, learning-centered, and inquiry-based, as opposed to mugging and rote learning-based. For this, the classroom has to change. It has to be an extension of the community. In fact, you, in the other conversation, we are talking about Gurukul. And I, I can never, I fully agree that probably because we had a scale that was affordable at that time, that some 10 people could come together and a guru could literally teach them not just learning, but yes. living itself. Yes. I think that if we can somehow uh, replicate that model with scale, because our challenge now is scale, we are a hugely populous country, we to address larger number of people. Think not that everywhere people have addressed this issue, uh, we partner, uh, we have to partner together. You know, the more advanced educational institutions, uh, places where we are able to experiment with some of these pedagogies, like at ISB, there's a huge component of experiential learning that we offer to our students. Now, those of us who understand, in ISB we have also our teacher training program, you know, in which we bring teachers from other places and teach them, including of the subject of the flipped classroom. And the last thing I want to say about pedagogy is the, um, you know, we are at this surf, touching the surface of using the digital medium. So we have just, like you said, we have replicated the physical class into a digital class. Mm -hmm. But that's just a change in the medium. But the, there's a huge world of opportunity awaiting as digitalization is fully adopted and technologies like AR, you know, augmented reality and virtual reality actually get and become a part of education delivery, mm -hmm. then classrooms can be really exciting places mm -hmm. for students to explore the world outside mm -hmm. in a manner that was never imagined before. Mm -hmm. Students can see 3D dimensional pictures and videos of things that you can see and affordably because the technology is rapidly getting, right. you know, affordable and commercializable. So these are three, four things, you know, student-centric learning, action-centric learning, inquiry-based learning, act, you know, community-oriented learning, life skills learning, and flip classrooms, and use of digital media, not as just a replication of the physical media, but the, a model change, literally, right. in terms of how students learn. I think this will inform the pedagogy of the future. Right. And we have to train our teachers for that. Right. So, so this actually brings to me, brings me to my next uh, follow-up on what you've just talked about. Is about, uh, uh, you know, we've talked about the methodology of uh, uh, teaching, but or a methodology for uh, inducing learning. But what are the, what are the, the skills which you think are going to be important uh, going forward? Uh, you know, as, as I was also mentioning, we have actually focused too much on content uh, uh, that is uh, uh, content and knowledge and not really on the skills which are really required to do well. Uh, and to do well could be, could be uh, either at the workplace or on the personal front. True. So uh, what in your view are the, are the critical skills which we really need to inculcate uh, yeah. no, going I, forward? I would, I would recommend we step back for a minute. <clears throat> and ask the question, why the skills? Then it'll tell us what skills. Right. So my, uh, I mean, based on what I've read, learned, and what we are seeing happening in the more advanced areas where people have evolved their education systems to a higher level, they, they, uh, it looks that it makes sense to address skills in three areas. One is in the area of work. Another is in the area of life. And the third, a much neglected area of citizenship. I would call it citizenship. You can call it community, mm -hmm. society, uh, society etc. But belonging to a, with a collective civic sense to belong to a society, with a responsibility to build it to its next future. Now, for various reasons, uh, historically the way we have come out of being a colony and poverty and trying to get some employment around our millions of people, our education has been highly employment oriented. 
even that has not been a very successful journey but we have made quite a lot of in fact the kind of examples you did it fills me with pride that we now have a state where there is a course possible to do ai ml formally in a, a rural town college you know mm-hmm. which is an amazing progress having said that these are still partial answers to the building of the holistic uh, person that we want to build for the future the society in future needs people to be ready for work related skills which increasingly will include uh, a whole lot of digital literacy because a lot of work will get done through which is so therefore the kind of skills that you talked about currently ai ml or tomorrow whatever next comes uh, currently iot currently 4d 3d printing etc so all the new things that are happening in technology basically the advances in computer sciences and robotics if you like that will continue to be a future set of skills in the area of work because that's an area where work is growing other liberal arts based skills also in terms of in in economics and social sciences all that will also grow but i want to focus more on life skills and i want to focus more on civic skills on life skills clearly the biggest need is critical thinking critical thinking analytical skills problem solving are three important things and especially in this country where a huge unfortunate combination of a very hierarchical society that doesn't even allow people to ask questions mm-hmm. and keeps the teacher like a boss you know who's kind of ruling and and, and you have to just sort of say guess the best student is one who guesses what the student's teacher wants to hear and the teacher keeps on asking so do you know do you know till you get the right answer the teacher keeps on prodding you and the what is the right answer the right answer is what the teacher thinks is the right answer this is a sure way of not building an innovative society our young people have to be taught taught to ask questions okay so that is a big change and you know? literally a paradigm shift if you like so i would call uh, critical thinking analytical skills uh i and you know problem solving at the top of the uh life skills mm. the next set of skills would be about more in terms of working in teams working collaboratively working with others so the whole band of skills called interpersonal skills where people are able to be with each other because nothing meaningful in the world can right. be done alone right so you need to understand that we we kind of can work in communities so interpersonal skills and Uh, companies are awfully missing them and they are looking for a higher education to supply a talent you know pipeline which is ready with more interpersonal awareness and interpersonal skills and uh, you know finally let's move to the whole issue of civic uh, uh, skills I, i think you know this is one area not just india the whole world is guilty of not preparing uh, more responsible global citizens today there are just a number of problems that uh, is impacting the world uh, climate related problems the this sheer awareness mm. of a college student mm. about as i said why should there be a recycling mm-hmm. what does plastic do why, what what's the way to manage garbage and the address mm-hmm. address systems mm-hmm. how to handle city planning how to look at uh, plantation and greenery or uh, what is a circular economy how do i create a more frugal economy and save the resources of the world i think this cannot be the preserve of a few elite who understand this and discuss in glasgow they have to be common man's information he has to be a part of that awareness and that urge to contribute to that and earth can't be protected by governments mm-hmm. civil mm-hmm. servants and uh, professors they have to be protected with the average citizen Very so we we need to kind of build that skills uh, let's take issues like um, the growing intolerance in the world Uh, inability to live inclus- in inclusive ways uh, build more equity and fairness and justice gender sensitivity and tolerance uh, ability to include the people with physical and other challenges into the mainstream uh, religious tolerance these are things which have to be taught literally because we seem to have lost them and there is growing uh, narrowness in education education itself is sometimes being used to promote such sectarian and narrow thoughts and orthodoxies so that in the advanced countries i mean a, a simple thing logical thing like that there is a uh, covid and we need to take a vaccine 
the 30% people in Europe mm. who don't want to take a vaccine. <laughs> now, what explains this? I would consider it a failure of education. Mm. A failure of, like Nehru said, we should have the scientific temper, the, the curiosity to know and, know and learn. We seem to have somewhere lost that. And it's a pity that education is actually getting used for the pur opposite purposes mm -hmm. of building orthodoxies mm -hmm. as opposed to a more secular and more open debated society. So that is the kind of citizenship behaviors. The last thing I'll say, particularly for India, which I'm very concerned, not as a professor, but as a citizen, is that it beats me to know why so many educated people wouldn't drive in the lane of a traffic. Why wouldn't they throw, why would they throw a Coke can on the road? Mm -hmm. I mean, that India will be a great uh, economic superpower. Perhaps I have less doubt. Mm -hmm. But would India be a cultural powerhouse? Mm -hmm. Will it be a civic society? Will it be a civilized world? Mm -hmm. Will people respect each other? Mm -hmm. Will we know how to live with each other more responsibly? I guess that is a bigger challenge. Mm -hmm. So culture, culture is not in the sense of a reactionary sense of we had Kajura, how we had dance. Culture in the sense of how do we stay cultured with each other, right. I guess has to be a part of curriculum. We have to catch the youngsters at the time of their education and build a, a responsible mm -hmm. civic uh, sense in all of them. So if you combine these three, work mm -hmm. skills are easy to predict, mm -hmm. difficult to uh, implement, but it is possible because industry will lead that uh, mm -hmm. front because they need people. So they'll tell you what skills they want. But we have to step back as policy backers and make more proactive stances on life skills and on civic Civics. and citizenship skills. No, very, very, Those very, are my, my I would thoughts. say very, yeah. very rightly put by you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 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 I mean, uh, going forward, I think, uh, because right now the focus of both parents as well as students is actually only on employability skills. And uh, I, I entirely agree with you that we have to actually uh, integrate both life skills and uh, civic skills. Uh, and employability itself is suffering because yes. of that. I agree employability with you. doesn't exist in vacuum. Companies ex exist in society. And if the societal skills are lacking, we are spending time uh, handling sexual harassment cases in workplaces mm -hmm. where people are supposed to have come with mm -hmm. more sophistication right. than in other places, you know. Right. So the fact that modern workplaces right. have sexual harassment is a shame on uh, everything that we do together, isn't it? Very true. So uh, we, we need to sort of think and even, about even, it. Even, even you constantly see this issue of you know, people who are actually uh, working in uh, 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 good salaries, actually really don't know what to do with the money which they earn. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of it is actually wasted on... Uh, and, and, and conspicuous and, consumption yes. in a society of uh, inequities. You know, it is such a so, if, the, if those who have the money can't be responsible with what they do, then we will never have it, the equity that we want. So, so, no, very nice. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you've done the, I think the, the basic readiness seems to be there now, much more than that. But then, um, if we were to make Telangana literally a kind of a, a case study and a, an exemplar state, you know, whether in the short term or in the long term, if you were to sort of end this conversation with some kind of a vision that you have, Something that you would like Telangana's higher education and engineering education to stand for. How do you see that? So, um, I think, uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, a collection of what we have actually talked about. Mm. So, one is that on the technology front, we are uh, leaders in the sense, we are the future leaders. We are currently in many ways, but we should be clearly the future leaders. I mean, uh, a, a, an entity which has to set up base should choose Hyderabad, uh, not just for the physical reasons, but also uh, for its uh, uh, the quality of manpower which we provide here. So that is, I would say, one. And two is, uh, as you rightly put, and the, the, the people who come out of our education system should be well-rounded individuals, Correct. not just not just uh, employable in the in the in the skilled in the labor <laughs> skilled part of it but also i yeah. know uh, they should know how to handle themselves and the environment in which they work True. as well as the society at large so i would say that would be that 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 would be our objective and that is the direction in which we are trying to move forward on wonderful wonderful no, it, it's been good to have you someone drive this uh, you know, very important part of the state's agenda. Look forward to more of such conversations. 
on purpose to start this dialogue, as I wanted to say, at least from my point of view, I'm sure to you, is that people who have been listening to us, but they must step up. They must not just use the question hour here, but beyond this, they must increase their engagement. You know, I'm quite impressed by, I don't know what reality will it produce, but the Delhi government's initiative to get the average citizen to be a mentor to a school student is an interesting initiative. So if we say that, you know, all education has to be just provided by the government or the rich industrialists or politicians who can start up colleges, it's a very small contribution. It's only when the average citizen contributes mm -hmm. to the broader agenda of learning that there will be a change. So I want to also use this dialogue right. to kind of leave with my, our thoughts with the audience that right. we should see that they engage, they contribute and prod you to do the next best thing. And you probably work with us in education sure. to, to do more joint research, more joint programs to sort of move the next orbit. Sure. Human capital is our biggest asset. We can't make it future ready. Pity. I agree with you. I, I, I fully agree with you. Thank you. Thank you then. I think we guess. I think uh, we, there's some questions. Guru uh, uh, is around here and I'm sure he would lead us to the next steps. Uh, we're going to have uh, Sridhar take the questions, Chandra. Uh, okay, sure. Sridhar? Yeah. 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 Have we done enough on time? Exceeded? No, no, we, we, are, we are bang on time. Yeah. Bang on time? Good. Seems to be good. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, just to start the questions from the audience, um, one Mr. Shomik Day is uh, mentioning. It is uh, remarkable to hear from Commissioner Mittal how he innovated to improve admission rates of government and technical education institutions. One wonders how placements of candidates would have fared after, particularly for the new technical courses students. That is for uh, Prof. Mittal and pro for Professor, uh, if uh, Professor can take us through the ISB journey in managing quality education through and after a pandemic. Thank you. This is from Shamik Dev. Uh, so, Sh 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 Shamik, uh, I think it's a very good question which you asked because uh, I talked about the inputs, but what is the outcome of that? Uh, not just the numbers, but in terms of placement. So, I can tell you about some experience which we have in our degree colleges, you know, where we introduced uh, uh, the new course combinations in the year 2018 era and first batch just came out. And we see a... Uh, a, a marked improvement in the in the employability of those students. No, there are there are few reasons for that. One is most of the students have actually got uh, uh, extremely good <clears throat> computer skills. No, because many of them have taken uh, uh, I would say eighty percent of our students now are taking computer science as a combination in physical BSc physical sciences. Hundred percent of our students are have computer applications as a combination in BCom, and about uh, twenty percent plus have in uh, BA. But they also study basic and advanced computer skills as a compulsory uh, course combination. And uh, when we talk to our, our, our faculty members and our principals, we, and across the board, the, the answer is that there's a, there's a marked increase in the, in the employability of the students and the pit placements. Uh, but the new technology once, uh, uh, they were introduced last year. So, uh, uh, you, you know, technical or engineering education is a four-year curriculum. So uh, uh, we expect the, the first batch to come sometime around uh, 2024 is, is when, the, when the batch would come out. But uh, for the students who are already there, we are offering uh, them two things. One is uh, they can either have a minor uh, combination or they can have a specialization combination in the sense minor is something which is more horizontal program. For example, if I'm doing a BTEC in mechanical engineering, I can do actually a minor in uh, computer science and engineering, which then adds on to what I'm I'm studying. Uh, specialization is more 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 vertical or no a deeper combination in the sense if I'm doing let's say uh, a BTEC in mechanical engineering, I can do a specialization in robotics, and this is something which we have permitted to the current third year uh, students. So if they do a 20 credits uh, extra. In a, in, a, in a horizontal subject, they can have a minor or if they do 20 extra credits in a, in a, in a vertical subject, they can, they can have a specialization. And I think this would be giving us pretty good results in the, in the coming years. Hmm. Interesting. So you're focused on building that, the relevance, if you like, you know. Good. But uh, Sridhar, you were saying something else? I... Yeah, um, just a second, yes. 
Yeah, uh, basically he was uh, wanted to check uh, from the ISB journey's point of view on managing quality education through and after a pandemic from your perspective. Well, <clears throat> no, ISB like any other global school in the world was equally hit by pandemic. So I don't want to start saying that we have miraculously solved the problem of the pandemic. But whatever have been the characteristic strengths of ISP have served us well even during the pandemic. What are they? Let's sort of look at honestly. I think the first credit uh, and the first contribution that ISP gets to be a global school is actually the quality of students who come to us. They are really the engines of our success, honestly. Because we get some of the best students. The, luckily, because of the overtime, the, the quality of education and the reputation that has been built, we get Ivy League students. And in fact, in the pandemic year, since um, people of India didn't want to go to the US and other countries, the admissions cutoffs in ISB exceeded those of Harvard and <laughs> others in the sense that the same students who had gone there is now here, you know, in the sense. So obviously, we get high quality students who contribute to. And during the pandemic, they showed both resilience, adaptability, and they took to digital education. Although like everyone else, they had their own anxieties. But they took to it almost as and also being digital natives of the new generation. They could do it far easily. And I think that contributed literally one third of the success of ISB to kind of sail through. And that resilience we saw so much more that actually our admission rates and the pressure on admission, the number of applicants, everything has significantly increased. Contrary to the belief, between the two pandemic years, we have more applications for our MBA courses or PGP courses than ever before. The third, other third of ISB is obviously the, the research focus and the cutting edge uh, teaching and pedagogy that our faculty here bring has been, has been able to at attract a solid, uh, very, very highly focused and research, high quality faculty from global uh, sources here. And it is that, uh, you know, which has stood so much so that all the faculty here adapted to the digital uh, medium of teaching, uh, the teaching through the Zoom, and we set up in rapid speed in weeks studios where we could come and use uh, teaching. We all of us moved to home teaching with the, you know, the right equipment. We were all trained by world's best institutions uh, who had earlier done online education. We were all formally trained to learn how to teach on the digital medium. And it's not the same as standing up and teaching in a classroom. And we innovated our course offering. Uh, upfront, we created what is called a digital Head Start module so that we can get the students move rapidly through the first part of the course, including a course on leadership, which we offer in the very beginning of our premier PGP program. We offered on the digital medium mm -hmm. and all of them, you know, there's no reason to believe that the learning outcomes were in any manner compromised. Mm -hmm. So we kept that. While we couldn't afford, we couldn't create due to social distancing norms, the campus quality experience, mm -hmm. the rest of the education in learning outcome terms, I think we nearly maintained the same level of engagement that we could do. We managed to alter the schedule a little bit to choose, I mean, to suit the new imperatives of the pandemic where students took time. And all this we did in addition to when finally students to the, came to the campus during the later part of the pandemic with a lot of healthcare measures, a lot of healthcare measures, uh, you know, quarantine camps and regular tests and doctors and all that. So. I think uh, the parents, teachers, uh, students worked very hard to get this, you know, process go through. And that the other third of ISB always has been our partner schools and our uh, visiting faculty, our international faculty. And they continue to support us through this process. Of course, the medium of the fact that they didn't have to travel only made, made matters easy. And we could still get them as much as we used to get in the past. So, so so the three pillars of success, if you like, the research-focused resident faculty and the cutting-edge students of high IQ and capability, and also great partner schools, great curriculum, great uh, global focus of the school with global partnerships, both in faculty 
and in other institutional terms, I think continue to keep ISB on the edge. Right. And digital adaptation probably happened pretty naturally here. I think, and I think uh, uh, hearing you, I am also pretty convinced that uh, this will also help ISB to uh, use the same strategy for more executive education. No, true, true, people true. who people who have an opportunity cost of leaving the job and coming to the campus. I think if if uh, if this same we are order, doing, and in fact we are doing more. We are also now using this digital world now right. to kind of step up significantly on our online offerings. Right. Right. We are going to do that very big. Yeah, yeah. Professor Chandra, we just have uh, time for two more questions, and maybe we need a uh, quicker answers. Um, sure. One, uh, uh, Mr. Mittal, what lessons from Telangana could we replicate in other states? I mean, from your perspective. So I think uh, uh, the the lesson is that uh, uh, if you go deeper into things, you would actually find answers. And in fact. Uh, uh, the reason why many times we, we we don't change things or the system doesn't change is because we look at the surface of it and uh, we, th we think that everything is going on fine. But actually when you go deep into things and you actually uh, uh, start looking at the finer points of it, you realize that uh, there's a tremendous possibility for change. And I think this applies not just to the education sector but no, in, in any field. Uh, that I would say is a, is a, is a big learning. Uh, if you uh, want uh, me to talk about learnings from the education sector, I think it is all about yeah. flexibility uh, in offerings, uh, mm -hmm. more student-centric uh, uh, choices in the sense student should decide what he or she wants to study. And uh, uh, moving ahead with the times, whether it is in your course offering or in the way uh, things are offered. Um, the next question is uh, from uh, Dr. Sudha. What do you think uh, will be the future and role of liberal arts? Question to whom? Uh, Navinji. I think uh, uh, liberal... Can uh, so uh, my, my answer would be liberal arts is very, very important. Uh, uh, only thing is, is, is we have to kind of uh, uh, move forward from the way liberal arts have been offered in the past because it is too much about uh, 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 exam-centric uh, teaching rather than uh, uh, life-centric life -centric, uh, teaching. Uh, or, or no, uh, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and one of the key reasons for that is the way our assessments are held. Uh, so a so lot of our teaching is no, actually to pass exams and I don't think that will take us anywhere. No? You can call it liberal arts, you can call it humanities, you can call it uh, arts or whatever. But if you have to really, really experience the benefit of it, then you have to move into making people think and then contribute in whatever way possible to, to as, as Chandra just said, to, to, to life uh, uh, of their own or to society or to the workplaces. Uh, if, if we can do that, I think we will be really experiencing the power of liberal arts. Correct. Absolutely. Um, one more last question, uh, probably. Uh, do we have a model to offer skilling at scale to, to make a positive impact on India's advantage in demographic dividend? So, so the, the short answer for that is that technology uh, is making it possible. So gone are the days when you know, people had to physically uh, 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 come to a place and then learn those skills. Today, with the help of technology, you can you can offer something at scale. I mean, Chandraji talked about augmented reality, virtual reality. So you can do things with virtual labs. You don't even have to have a costly equipment uh, uh, at a fraction of it. And once you develop it, I mean, it is it is available. It is it is available. Then the incremental cost of uh, reaching to the next person is zero. Uh, and when you are doing it physically, I mean, you have to suppose I have to I have to give that offering, let's say in Hyderabad and let's say in Bangalore you have to actually replicate the, the same setup. But once you do it uh, digitally, you can, you can reach out anywhere in the country. Yeah. So, so technology is the, is, the, is the driver for offering yeah. uh, skills at scale. Absolutely. The only thing that will round it up is if we can also step up internships, apprentices yes. in industry-based yes. learning, yes. Uh, that would be far, that will bring really, it will complete the journey.
So otherwise it's staying even if digitally, right. it'll stay at the level of learning and not go to application. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. So we just have time for this only. Um, there are many more questions, uh, but I'm afraid we can't take it. Uh, just have a minute for Guru to conclude. Probably. Thank you, Shridhar. Uh, Thank you. I, I just want to uh, just make this remark that we've had uh, close to 500 participants logging onto this dialogue. Uh, it's wow. an unprecedented number in terms of uh, participants uh, and also a good number of them on Facebook Live. So it sort of why I mentioned this is because it refers, uh, it points to two things. One, the importance of the topic itself, uh, you know, uh, how and the fact that everybody is invested in this in you know, preparing a future ready human capital and such an important one. And uh, two, uh, without a doubt, uh, the fact that we have these two experts here uh, sharing your insights. So I wanna thank both of you, uh, Sri Navin Mittal for you know, sort of such a lucid sort of manner in which you shared your insights coming from uh, over three years of experience just in this particular sector, notwithstanding the over two decades of your experience as an administrator in the Indian Administrative Service. So thank you very much. I know that the future of higher education and technical education is bright in Telangana, and hopefully that will also sort of lead to other states and other places across, because I think you're talking broadly about India in some sense. Uh, uh, Chandra, thank you very much uh, for, you know, as always, uh, for leading the discussion in the manner that's very unique to you and for bringing out the best in, uh, you know, I particularly like the way you started off saying you don't see yourself as a sage on stage, but as a guide on the side, you know, I, I'll remember that. Uh, I think there are many such things that we all have benefited from. Uh, I want to thank the ISB Studios team led by Ajay. Uh, and all our colleagues at the external relations team and uh, Mr. Mittal to your department and a uh, large number of you know colleagues of yours as, are on the call as well, on the uh, dialogue as well. Thank you very much and uh, hope to continue this engagement. And uh, Mr. Mittal, we hope to continue to work with you. We are in Telangana, you know, anything that ISB can do to support, please do let us know. We'll be very happy. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, we look forward to sort of staying connected in this. Thank you. Very Thank, much. You. Thank, Thank you, Gurgan. Thank you, Chandraji. Good to meet you.